Hi, welcome back to Mosso Metrics. I'm Prati Kamasani, and in this video, we're going to look into the semantic model creation. Well, we did create the semantic model in the previous video, but in this video, we're going to look into how to make changes to the semantic model by using Semantic Link Labs. Semantic Link Labs is driven from the SemPy Python library. SemPy Python library is a fantastic resource if you want to work with your semantic models by using the Python notebooks. So there is a there are plenty of blog posts and the videos and so much information about how to work with semantic links and semantic link labs and there's a really nice GitHub documentation on the semantic link labs itself. So what we're going to do today is use these Senpai and Semantic Link Labs to work with our model. For that, I'm going to go back to my workspace. Again, instead of using the curated most metrics folder, I'm actually going to go back to my validated folder. This is where I'm kind of doing all the operations related to the development and things like that. So here, I'm going to create another notebook. And I'm going to use the right environment. My environment already has the semantic link labs included in it. And to begin with, I'm just going to import Senpai Labs. The next thing is to connect to my semantic model. As I mentioned previously, it's not great to keep the static strings in your code. You could parameterize them for, for this solution. I'm kind of leaving working with the static strings. And this is my data set and also the workspace where my data set is. There's nothing new here. It's basically using Tom instead of using the other tools that we have been working with so far, or instead of using the DMVs in the analysis services days, here we are basically literally using the same functionality, but using the different approach. So here it shows me the tables I have in my semantic models. It's a small semantic model. I kind of already know those are the tables I'm working with. I'm not happy with the way my table names and things are. I don't, I want to replace my underscores with a space. For my self-service BI, I don't want have that kind of a developer naming conventions. Usually what we do is we go to our semantic model, we probably have to go to pretty much each and every column and start updating them. Or you could use other tools like Tabular Editor and things like that to go and do those things. But by using semantic link labs, you could literally with the like a three code lines of code, you could go and update all the tables and and the column names into the naming convention that you want. In here, I am basically just updating my data sets with the all the names, all the table names, and all the column names. I'm replacing underscore with space. So if I execute this code again over here, as you can see, I have the right naming convention. Uh, well, not there yet, but at least my underscores are not there anymore. So the next thing that what I want to do is I want to have all my tables to a nice snake case. For that, I'm again going to use a tiny bit of code. It's basically going to do the exactly what's been happening in the previous block. It's going to go and loop through all those tables and the column names and update names to title case. So let me execute that. And if I rerun the same code, I should be able to see my tables where I have a nice title case. And if I want, I could go and see all the columns as well. But actually, let's go and see columns here. So if I refresh this window, and as you could see, my table names has nicely updated, and so does my column names are nicely updated into a snake case. And that was very easy. There are so many other things that we could do with this uh, by using the semantic link labs. But for now, I'm not going to work with the, all the other possible things that I could do. What I actually want to do is to work with the creating the measures. One way to create the measures is you go to your design view and start creating new measure and uh, update update the metadata related to the measure. So for example, if I create a new measure called measure 1, 
and I could go to properties and I could go and start updating the things related to the measures. Especially when we're talking about self-service BI, it is important to have the description for each measure so our end users can quickly, easily go and understand what's happening. And you could also, this extra descriptions and everything is quite useful for the co-pilot report creations as well. But however, instead of doing the measures over here, let me actually go and delete this from Modo. I could go and create measures in my notebook as well. The benefit of it is you have all your measures captured and kept it in one notebook. If there is something going on with your semantic model, and especially when you're working with the direct click and you're working in the, in the web view and you, I mean, I've done it many times where I just want to just go and delete the semantic model and restart again. But when I do that, I will lose all my measures, all the work I've done in that one. So in case if I actually keep all the measures and the descriptions, the metadata related to my measures in a notebook, next time if I go and create a new semantic model, I just go here, update my data set name, and then all the measures descriptions, the definitions that I have in the notebook, I could just immediately publish into my new semantic model. That's one way. But there are, I think there are many other benefits. It's speed up the process. It is, uh, you have a quick whole glance view of all the measures, all the calculations that's happening in your semantic model in one document. It is easy to document. Um, and it's great, especially when you're working as a consultant, you go to a client and you want them to understand, like, you know, a, you want to give them a one view of all the calculations that's happening on the semantic model and you just give the notebook and it explains everything. And on top of it, you could use a copilot and update the descriptions of all the measures by using the copilot. So here I have code to create my measures. What's happening here is it's basically connecting to the Tom and it's going to the tables and it's looking for my fact table. So in this case, I have one fact table. So all the measures I'm creating are inside that fact table. You could go and create, if you have multiple fact tables, then you could go and mention the if this name, then create these measures. And within that, I have this list of measures and giving the name expression, the format string for my measure, what is the description, and what is the display folder for that. So if I execute this, it's honestly like very quick. So I've executed quite a few measures and it took four seconds. And if I go back to my Power BI model and do a, so this is where I tried creating the measures. And if I go and do a refresh and see the folders. Now you could see there are the display folders and within my display folders I have the measures that I created. And uh, that's a quite a few measures but I also have like a nice naming conventions and everything. And I could, if I go and click on those measures I could also go and see there is a description populated, the format string is updated, so if I go and see one of those, one of those like average temperature, then it could go, you could see like a, it's updated to the decimal number. So it's nicely, quite quickly, I could create many measures and um, it's there updated with all the metadata. One drawback of this is like, a, especially when you're creating like a nice complicated DAX measures, you do want to have that kind of a debugging facility where you execute a bit of it, you return a variable and then see what's happening within that variable and then you go back and you create another variable, see, like you debug while you're creating it. From that perspective, notebook is not great, but in when in the scenarios like that, I would probably create where by using my Power BI desktop, to be honest, and then bring it back to my uh, notebook. So it makes my life like I still have all my measures in my notebook. And also I could keep that in the in Git nicely and control it and all those things. So the other thing that's happening in this code block is to make sure if there is a measure already there, 
then update it instead of going and recreating. So because the, if the measure is already there, it's going to throw an error saying like, hey, the same measure is already there. But now what it does is it actually goes and checks if the measure is there. If the measure is there, update it, otherwise create a new measure. And I could do the same thing with the calculation groups as well. And when I'm creating calculation groups, I usually just go to this Microsoft Docs and literally I kind of just copy pretty much every calculation item that I, that is here because whatever the project I go, this seems to be the same calculations that pretty much most of them they need especially within the calculation group. Outside, it's different, but within the calculation group, you don't really need so many things. It's usual time intelligence is where calculation group works really nice. So I could, I usually just go and get my definitions from here. And once I have it in a notebook, the definitions, all that for every project we are working on, this could be like a little framework. You could just go execute this notebook, change the right parameters that's needed for based upon the semantic model and all those things. And it's really speeds up the process. Here is my calculation group. It took me three seconds to create it. And it's a very basic time intelligence calculation group to calculate current, previous year, year on year, year on year percentage. And if I go back to my model and do a quick refresh, I could see my time intelligence is created. I have a little warning next to it. But if I go to my workspace and do a quick refresh and go to my open the model again, the error should be gone. There it is. And if I click a do a quick new report, and I could actually even see my calculation group there. I updated my date table with a lot more columns, and I also did a bit of co-pilot with the with the measures definitions. Um, I gave my measures as a, an example, and I asked co-pilot, working with weather data, have temperature snowfall, and things like that. I would like to do a bit of correlation and things like that. So it came back with a lot more measures. So I added all that measures and published into a new semantic model. Now, when I go and refresh my new semantic model, I could see my new metrics. And I also have my calculation group. So if I go back to my model and do a refresh of this new model and go back to my data model, I should be able to see my calculation group. Now my model is pretty ready to go and do reporting. So let me just drag a few items to see if I have any data. So I have the record count, which is just 1000, which is wrong because I was getting only 1000 rows because I forgot to delete my limit on my data frame. So once I execute this notebook, I should have the right amount of data in my lake house and so does in my semantic model. So once I have all my data, my model should be in a stage for the reporting, except I haven't made updates to my date table. I want to do the sorting of the columns of the date table, but apart from that, the model is in a pretty good shape for the reporting. In the next video, we will look into getting the inspiration for the reporting and then creating the reports. See you in the next video.